This is The Human Side of Healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever-changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co-host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. Welcome to The Human Side of Healthcare. Delighted you're with us today. And you know, today we want to talk about something that's really fun. We're going to talk about how some of our children's hospitals actually use dogs and they're beneficial to those young patients. We're going to be talking to Laura Sonnefeld, who is the Facility Dog Program Coordinator at Cook Children's Hospital located in Fort Worth. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here this morning. You know, to help our listeners kind of grasp and understand this, can you first define what is a facility dog? Absolutely. So a facility dog is a professionally trained dog that will work alongside um, an employee of a facility. So, for example, at our hospital, all of our dogs work alongside a healthcare worker in their role in the hospital. The dogs are here to work alongside their handlers, and they help provide therapeutic interventions, um, help provide calm and anxiety reduction, motivation, encouragement, a little bit of laughter and normalcy in a very abnormal setting such as a hospital. From Cook Children's point of view, why do you think these facility dogs are beneficial to your patients? The facility dogs are hugely beneficial because they're providing uh, patient satisfaction, Uh, not only patient satisfaction, but parent satisfaction as well. We have lots of kids that are here for the first time, never had to be hospitalized, and when they see something normal that they would see on the outside world, such as a friendly dog, it helps to bring their anxiety down, Um, and we notice that there's lots of beneficial wellness reasons for interacting with a dog that has been researched, and we are seeing those benefits every single day with the work that our dogs do across the medical center. Can you tell us a little bit about the dogs you use? Is it a certain breed that you use, or is there anything unique about these dogs? Absolutely. So all of our dogs have come from two different groups called one is canine assistance and one is canine companions. Both of these programs breed and train facility dogs and service dogs. So all of them are Golden Retrievers or Labradors, or we have two Golden Doodles as well in our program. Um, And they all go through a pretty intense training um, from essentially the time that they are little puppies. Um, They go through training at their facilities with their foster families um, until they're ready for placement at a facility. So in our program, we have three Golden Retrievers, one Labrador Retriever, and two Golden Doodles. You know, when you use these facility dogs, what different departments do they help within the hospital? Absolutely. So we have a a variety of disciplines that are dog handlers. So a majority of our dog handlers are child life specialists, and our child life specialists work across the inpatient and outpatient areas all over our hospital. In particular, we have a child life specialist that works in the hematology and oncology inpatient unit with their dog, Chanel. And then we have another dog who works in our rehabilitation and transitional care unit, and that is Bree. Um, Both of these dogs specifically work with their child life handlers in those two populations. And then we also have a dog, Zuni, who works in our behavioral health program. She works both on the outpatient and inpatient side of that program. Our dog, Kitty, works in our care team clinic, which is um, the clinic where patients are coming for um, exams for trauma or physical abuse. And last but not least, we have Steve and Neely, who cover a broad variety of patient populations across the hospital, and they take referrals um, across about eight different inpatient units, um, serving anywhere from gastroenterology to endocrinology to post-surgery, um, just a variety of different diagnoses that those dogs can see. To help our listeners kind of visualize this, and you mentioned inpatient and outpatient in the various departments, how exactly do the dogs interact with the patient? 
Absolutely. That's a good question. So on the inpatient side, our dogs are visiting kids that will be staying the night and it could be anywhere from a few nights to we have patients that are here for months at a time. Um, the dogs are able to go in and out of each of the patient's rooms, ones that want to be visited and they work alongside their handler. So for example, our child life staff are in and out of those rooms providing normalization, preparation, education for the patients that are here, and the dogs can come alongside them to help calm nerves during maybe a new diagnosis education or preparation for a surgery. And then on the outpatient side, we get a lot of referrals to help with procedural support. For example, um, patients that have to get lab work done or have to get IVs or maybe injections such as the flu shot. Um, I work a lot with my dog, Steve, um, on the outpatient side, and we come and help just provide that distraction or that support and that comfort um, for different procedures that have to be performed on the outpatient side. And with those patients, they are getting to go home at the end of the day. It's just more like a clinic visit or a doctor visit, and then they get to go home at the end of the day. So it looks a little bit different as far as we may see a patient once on the outpatient side, um, but then we may see a patient multiple times over the course of their inpatient stay. You know, I know you mentioned some of the breeds of dogs, but just how does a dog become a facility dog? It's a great question. So the two groups that we have gotten our facility dogs from, um, they only will train dogs that they breed um, themselves within their, their entity. Um, there's a lot of DNA and genetics that go into that process. Um, and so they're assessing along the way. Um, but for example, with my dog, Steve, he was one of seven puppies um, in that litter. And five of those dogs all ended up getting facility dog positions at different hospitals across the country. So part of their assessment during the training is they take the dogs to children's hospitals um, and they make assessments of it, does it look like the dog's enjoying their work? Um, or do they enjoy engaging with people? Or do you have a dog that maybe is a little bit more anxious being in a group setting or smelling all the smells um, of a hospital? All these dogs are incredibly smart dogs and very well can be very well trained, but you may have some dogs that would be a better fit to be in service to an individual and be a service dog. They told us they knew pretty early on with Steve that he would thrive in a facility because he is definitely, he shines when he's in a group setting. He makes sure that everyone gets to say hello to him. He spends time with each person. He works the room. Um, so they knew early on that he really enjoyed his work and that he would be a good fit to be in a, some place more like a facility where he would see lots of different people um, across many different avenues. Well, you know, I've got to tell you, Lauren, I'll make sure Thomas understands this too. I haven't met your dogs, but I think Steve <laughs> might be my favorite. I don't know why I say that. He's my you know, favorite you, too, but I'm particular. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you have a program, Sit, Stay, Play. Can you explain to our listeners what that program is? Yes, sir. So Sit, Stay, Play is the facility dog program that was started at Cook Children's back in 2014. We started with two facility dogs and have grown since then. Um, at this point, we have six full-time facility dogs that work alongside healthcare workers. Isn't this a great story? Talk about the human side of healthcare. We'll hear more about the facility dog program at Cook Children's from the coordinator, Laura Sonefeld, when we come back. This is the human side of healthcare, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. Welcome back. We are talking about a wonderful program in Fort Worth at Cook Children's Hospital, the Facility Dog Program. Laura Sonefeld is the coordinator, and this is a program that benefits the kids, the patients, their families, the parents, and the staff. Talk about a triple win. So they have a program called Sit, Stay, Play. Laura, can you tell us what that's about? Yes, sir. So Sit, Stay, Play is the facility dog program that was started at Cook Children's back in 2014. We started with two facility dogs and have grown since then. Um, at this point, we have six full-time facility dogs that work alongside healthcare workers. Um, we have, so they are working together with their 
their handlers, their people, um, and they get to go wherever their handler goes in the hospital. Um, we have some restrictions around isolation um, where the dogs cannot go, but in general, the dogs get to do <laughs> anything they can alongside their their healthcare workers. But the goal behind the whole program was to provide just another layer of therapeutic interventions um, at the hospital. As I don't know if either of you guys have kids or have had to have an experience where you've brought your child to a hospital, but the hospital is a very intimidating environment for kids and parents alike. And if we can provide just one more layer of comfort for both the patients and the parents, um, then that's something that we want to be able to provide to all of the people that come into our doors. I will say there are definitely times where I walk into a room with Steve and he immediately goes to mom or dad instead of the patient. And most likely it's because mom or dad are the ones that are very anxious and need that extra comfort. And so he really is here. Our dogs are not just here for the patients, but they're here for the family unit overall. Let me ask you this. On the sit, stay, and play program, how is that funded? That's a great question. Our program is completely donor funded. Um, we The program began because um, we had some pretty big supporters in our community who felt like this program definitely was something that was needed and would be beneficial to our community. And our com- program continues to be run completely by donors. Um, we have we work with our foundation and our marketing team here at the hospital to continue to reach new donors, to get the support, provide stories. We do have a social media um, Instagram that is pretty popular, if I do say so myself. But that just helps us to get our story out about what our dogs and their handlers are doing here at the hospital. And we definitely completely rely on everything we can in order to provide all of our handlers and their teams with anything they need. Our dogs are living, breathing animals, and so they have food needs, they have toy needs, they have vet needs, um, and all of that is completely covered by our donor-funded program. No family is ever going to receive a bill for meeting one of our facility dogs or benefiting from any of their services, and we would like to keep it that way. For our listeners out there that may want to help support this program, what do you suggest? Uh, What I would suggest is if you are an Instagram um, person to follow us on our Instagram at sit, stay, play underscore CC. Um, That is where you'll see just a lot of our dogs in action, seeing what they're getting, what they get to do in the hospital. Um, But we also have on our Cook Children's website, which is cookchildrens.org. We do have a page that provides even more information about our program overall, um, a little more information specifically about each dog and their handlers and where they work in the hospital, um, but also provides a link for where we are able to accept donations. We do have a wish list of items that are regularly needed by our pups, and so that would be a great place to start if you want to learn even more about what um, the impact is that our facility dog handler teams are having on the patients, families, and staff here at Cook Children's. Laura, we've been through, obviously, an unprecedented two years in our current modern history. As you take a big step back, have there been any elements of this that jumped out and kind of surprised you? Maybe a couple of things that you weren't expecting that were added benefits? Well, I think in light of, you know, still surviving and being in a, in a pandemic right now, one of the biggest things that we have noticed is that People we have all the time think that our dogs are just here for patients and families, but the reality is that our dogs are hugely therapeutic for our staff as well. Um, we, Whenever we walk onto a unit to go visit patients, I always am very intentional about swinging Steve by the nurse's station to check in with them. Um, Providing a few minutes of Steve, you know, playing with them or sitting in their lap allows them some levity and allows them to take a deep breath before they have to go back into what is a pretty stressful job. And so I think it's hugely important for people to know that, like, our dogs really are making a huge impact on literally every person that walks into the medical center. Um, And that has, we've been able to, during the last almost two years now, been able to be a little more intentional about spending time specifically with staff, helping them with debrief through maybe a traumatic or a stressful situation. And it's pretty amazing to see our dogs walk into a group setting of staff members and you can feel everybody take a like collective deep breath. And you can witness like the magic of Steve just walks around 
and make sure everyone's doing okay. Then he goes to the next person and checks in with them. And all of our dogs have that it just intuition built into their personality. They know who to go to. They know who needs them the most. And um, we let them direct that <laughs> a lot of the times. Um, and it's pretty amazing to see that impact. Yeah, that is absolutely incredible. You know, I was thinking back, Steve and I have uh, not only seen a few New Year's Eve celebrations in our life, we've seen a lot of decade changes in our life. And one of the things that I remember back in the day is you could smoke on an airplane and they would absolutely (laughs) not allow animals on the plane. Well, now Uh you can't smoke on the plane and you can't have animals. So do you think this is a change that will permeate some of the future for not only healthcare but even how a lot of us handle things after this pandemic has taken so much from us over the last two years? I do think there's been a newfound appreciation for our pets. We do often get families that ask us, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, the impact that your dogs had on our child when we were here um, was amazing. We, we want a dog like y'all's dogs at home. And I always tell people, get a dog. Dogs in general have that intuition built into them. Even if our dogs were not trained like they were, I guarantee they would still have the intuition that they do. Um, That isn't something that I feel like is really taught to them. That is natural to them. So we do. You have this understanding that when you get home, for those of you who have pets or dogs, is that greeting, your dog loves you no matter what, no matter how stressful a day, and they just want to give you unconditional love. And so I do hope that people do see and understand like truly the impact that our animals can have on us and truly understand and appreciate the work that our dogs are putting in every single day. And in light of saying that as well, you know, we have some days where Steve's moving a little bit slower in the work day, and it's because He has seen and felt all of the emotions of all of the people that we have come into contact with. And that can take a toll on him. He does need to get rest. And it's the same thing for our pets at home. So we do need to be mindful of like, yeah, they want to give us never-ending love. um, But we also need to be mindful of taking care of them as well and making sure they get the breaks that they need. Well, you're talking about the ultimate empath here, aren't you? Somebody that can walk into the room and feel the energies of the people in that room. Absolutely. He picks up on everybody, every single emotion, which oftentimes there's more than one <laughs> that occurs. And he feels all of that. And, you know, there are times where he just gets to cuddle up and get into a bed with a patient and he falls asleep. And we have people that will be like, oh, it must be nice to sleep on the job. <laughs> and I have to be like, well, you know, he is a dog. He gets to sleep on the job. But what he's also doing right now is he's modeling how to relax. He's modeling how to bring the anxiety down in a room. And he's telling people that it's okay to take a break. Take a deep breath. I'm here. We're going to snuggle for a little bit. And that's all you need to do right now. You know, there are some belief systems that we might come back for another life after this one. And some people believe we might even come back as animals. I don't know that coming back as one of your dogs wouldn't be that bad of a gig. (laughs) We we have people say that a lot. They said, these dogs have a pretty good little job. And I said, I agree completely. They get love and attention all day long. And that's usually what most dogs, all they want is just love and attention from people that love them. You mentioned an Instagram account and a picture is worth a thousand words. How would people find you on Instagram? Um, You can look up at sit, stay, play underscore cc. Um, And there's a gorgeous picture of all six of our dogs on our profile picture that we just took recently. Um, And we try to post pictures of all of our dogs as they all very much have different personalities and different skill sets. They're all doing amazing work, but they definitely do it in their own way, um, which is another fun thing too. As people get to know about our dogs or get to know them, they realize that Steve is the goofball. Brie is a little bit of the, she's got a little bit of a sass when she walks. Chanel is our matriarch, and she is the cool, calm, and collected one. (laughs) And it's fun to get to know that all these dogs are very different, but also really excellent at their jobs in their own way. Well, you not only showed us the human side of healthcare today, Laura, you've shown us the canine side of healthcare, and thank you for that. Absolutely. Happy to share about our program, as I really feel like it makes a big impact. Thank you so much, Laura. You and your dogs have been a delight. Laura Sonnefeld from Cook Children's on the Facility Dog Program. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about the correlation between a simple UTI 
and something you may never have expected. Dr. Casey Benz from Methodist Health System joins us next to explain. Welcome back to the human side of healthcare, where we explore how to take better care of your health so you can live a happier, healthier life. With DFW Hospital Council CEO Stephen Love, along with Thomas Miller. Welcome to the human side of healthcare. Delighted you're with us today. And today we want to talk about a topic related to urinary tract infections and urology. And we are delighted that we've got with us. Dr. K.C. Benz, who's a urologist at Methodist Dallas Medical Center. Dr. Benz, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You know, for our listeners out there, they may not know a lot about what we refer to as UTI, urinary tract infections, but different people have different symptoms when they get UTI. Can you talk a little about those symptoms? Sure. So a UTI is a urinary tract infection, like you said. Um, It is usually due to a buildup of bacteria in the urine. Um, And symptoms can be variable. Um, Most commonly, patients have some type of urinary symptom, whether that be blood in the urine, really foul-smelling urine, or an increase in leakage of urine or incontinence. Um, But when it comes to more elderly individuals, they can also often develop confusion um, or what's also called delirium. Some of the elderly people, as you mentioned, can develop delirium. Can you tell us the link, if you will, that you've seen between delirium and UTIs in seniors? Why is that? Well, so I think um, it's important to understand what delirium really is. So it's a very vague term um, or a term that encompasses any type of alteration in your mental status or confusion, Um, and it can be caused by a lot of different things, usually some acute underlying medical issue. So either a worsening flare-up of a chronic illness like heart failure or diabetes. It can also be due to infection, um, and that's why we see it in patients that have urinary tract infections. But it's not just UTIs that can cause delirium. It's many other things and many other types of infections. And then certain medications can cause delirium. So there's a lot of things that can lead to it. Um, I think specifically in seniors, the reason that infections and UTIs commonly present with delirium is because their immune system is just not as robust as they once were. Their bodies are more sensitive, and specifically their brains are more sensitive to stresses that come with infection. So how common would you say delirium is in elderly patients when they do get a UTI? Um, I would say more than 50%. Um, I don't know if that's... (laughs) a a studied number, but I think it's very common um, and definitely much more common in older individuals. And again, that goes back to the sensitivity of their brain and the fact that they just don't have a robust immune response um, with fevers to fight infection um, like a younger person would. Is it possible that some of the patients or patients' families Confuse delirium with dementia. Oh, yes, that is definitely possible, and I think that is a common point of confusion. So the difference is that dementia is usually very slow onset, so it happens over the course of several months to years, um, and it is due to an actual anatomic change in the brain and is a true disease of the brain. Um, And it's also most of the time not reversible. So as it progresses, it gets worse and you can't really improve it. Whereas delirium, like I've said, is really due to an acute underlying issue and it develops over the course of a couple days. It can also fluctuate at different times in the day and is reversible after treating the underlying cause. You know, that's interesting in your answer. You meant even the time of day can impact it. Does that mean that 
you see it more frequently at nighttime than daytime, or is it kind of across the board? It can be seen more frequently at night, um, and that is due to what's called sundowning um, in elderly individuals, um, and that's I'm actually not sure the exact <laughs> medical reason on why it's more common at night, um, other than the fact that I think it, it becomes dark, gets a little harder to see, um, and it may lead to just a slight increase in confusion in older individuals. Are there any specific red flags, signs, symptoms that can help people trace the cause of the delirium back to a UTI as opposed to dementia? So I think looking out for some of these other symptoms that can be associated with a urinary tract infection, like blood in the urine, increase in continence, foul-smelling urine, complaining of abdominal pain or back pain, you know, if you had those things coupled with confusion and delirium, I think it would lean more towards a UTI and can make that a little bit more evident. And then I think as far as delineating from dementia, like I said, it's really the time to onset of the symptoms and whether this is kind of an acute confusion versus a long, slow progression in confusion. This is the human side of healthcare, and we're talking with Dr. Casey Benz, a urologist at Methodist Dallas Medical Center, about this correlation between urinary tract infections and delirium. Steve? You know, for your patients that present with urinary tract infection, what treatments are available for them? Treatment of a urinary infection would be primarily antibiotics. Um, in order to get rid of the bacteria that is growing in the urine. Um, other supportive treatments can be some IV fluids, pain medication, um, medication that can help with some of the symptoms of pain with urination. But really, the, the mainstay of treatment is going to be the antibiotics to really get rid of the infection um, and get a patient back to normal. You know, for a patient that goes through the treatment and takes the antibiotic, how soon, once they're treated, does the delirium improve? That is a little variable. Um, I would say that a lot of patients improve pretty rapidly. It kind of depends on the severity of the infection. Um, I think the more severe the infection, it may take a little bit longer for the delirium to resolve. You know, if patients have such a severe infection that they require a breathing tube or have infection in the blood and um, have really a severe illness, then um, that could definitely take longer. But once the antibiotics really start working and the infection is cleared, the delirium should resolve. You know, if our listeners... If they think uh, a family member is showing some symptoms of delirium, what should they do and what do you recommend they try to get the patient to do? I think just recognizing that your family member has some change in their mental status and is much more confused or not acting themselves is really important and I think the older your family member is, you know, looking out for these kind of sometimes even subtle changes um, where they just say sentences that don't make sense um, is really important. So recognizing it is number one. And then number two, these patients should be evaluated probably in an, in an emergency room setting. You could call your primary care doctor, but more often than not, when it comes to altered mental status, um, they're going to refer you to an emergency room for evaluation because, as I've stated, you know, it could be due to a whole lot of different things. Your patient definitely needs a workup of what's going on. So, yeah, I think uh, seeking out medical care as soon as possible would be my recommendation. And, you know, in the meantime, trying to get, I know that trying to get a confused elderly individual maybe in a car into an ER might be difficult, but uh, reassurance and redirection um, and explaining things can be very helpful. You know, Dr. Ben, as a urologist, I know we've asked you some questions about elderly. We've talked a little bit about delirium. But younger people, how common are UTIs in young people? 
Younger people do get UTIs. They don't always have these severe of symptoms, um, and particularly it's pretty uncommon for them to get delirium. Um, but a UTI can occur in younger people. It's definitely more common in women just because anatomically the urethra is much shorter than um, the urethra of a man. So, you know, I think it definitely happens, but most of the time it doesn't cause such severe symptoms that they need to be seen in an ER. It can often be handled by a primary care doctor and just given antibiotics, you know, orally as an outpatient for a few days or a week. You know, I know you're a physician and you probably shudder when you hear this, but I've heard growing up throughout my life, uh, hey, if you think you may have a kidney infection or a urinary infection, drink cranberry juice. Does diet have any impact on UTIs? So that is a great question. I think this is a common old wives tale, if you will. To answer it directly, if you get a urine infection or a kidney infection, drinking cranberry juice is not going to get rid of the bacteria. Sometimes it can help some of the symptoms of pain with urination, but the only thing that's going to actually rid the bacteria is an antibiotic. Now, some women who have recurring urinary infections, there is a slight amount of evidence that supports taking cranberry supplements every day and that that can sometimes reduce the number of UTIs a woman gets in any given year. Um, But that evidence is not very strong I would say it's minimally supported at best, but also cranberry supplements are not harmful. Um, And so if you are a woman that's having recurrent urinary infections, taking cranberry supplements may help you a little bit. And, you know, if it does, that's great. This is Dr. K.C. Benz, a urologist at Methodist Dallas Medical Center. This entire interview is on our podcast, The Human Side of Healthcare, also on our YouTube channel under the same name. When we come back, we're going to continue this conversation so we can help our elderly loved ones next on The Human Side of Healthcare. Covering the healthcare topics that matter most to North Texas. This is the human side of healthcare with DFW Hospital Council CEO Stephen Love, along with Thomas Miller. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. K.C. Benz, a urologist at Methodist Dallas Medical Center, talking about this incredible connection between temporary confusion and a urinary tract infection, particularly in elderly people. Steve? So regardless of your age, If you keep yourself hydrated, drink water frequently during the day, does that help in any way to prevent UTIs? Um, Not necessarily. You know, drinking water isn't really going to prevent you from getting an infection, again, because it's really the bacteria buildup. But it is important for overall kidney health to drink lots of fluid and keep your kidneys nice and hydrated. So again, I'm not sure it's actually going to really prevent you from getting an infection, but it is a great idea and a great practice to do in your daily life to drink lots of water and keep yourself hydrated. What causes, I never knew about this. This is amazing. So knew about UTIs, of course, but not that it was connected to our brain. What causes this bacterial buildup? I'm curious about how does bacteria grow in the urine? Well, that is a great question. Uh, There can be a lot of different reasons um, or different risk factors that make you more prone to developing bacteria in the urine. Um, Things would be things like um, having kidney stones or stones in the bladder. Those are nidus for infection um, and can increase your risk of uh, bacteria growth. Um, If you're not emptying your bladder all the way, Um, and you basically have a backup of urine in the bladder or the kidneys where it's sitting there kind of stagnant essentially and makes it, you know, a much more common place to develop bacteria. If you have an enlarged prostate, if you have a narrowing or scar tissue in the urethra, if you have any anatomic abnormalities of the genitourinary tract, all these things could make you more prone to um, a UTI. Now, as far as the actual inciting incident of how the bacteria first gets in the urine, um, you know, bacteria is all over your skin. It's at the tip of the urethra, and somehow it finds its way into the urine. And then if you 
have any of these risk factors, it puts you at much, much higher risk of actually developing an infection. Wow, that's a great explanation. Steve, you and I need to lean in and listen to this conversation here, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. No question about it. Well, so I'm wondering, as you were describing that list, what about excessive sugar in the diet or a low pH? Can, are those contributing? When we talk about excessive sugar, so not particularly in the diet, but if you have diabetes where your blood sugar is not well controlled, that actually can lead to um, basically spilling sugar into your urine. So your urine should usually not have sugar in it, but when you have diabetes, um, it is common to have sugar in the urine because your blood sugar is uncontrolled. Um, and in that case, bacteria feeds on sugar and makes it, you know, a much more, another risk factor for developing um, a urine infection. And when we visit the restroom at the doctor's office with the little cup in hand, is that checked in that test? Um, yes, it is. All right. If you get a UTI and you don't get on it soon enough, what I'm wondering, and this is not medical terminology, <laughs> how far south can a UTI go for older people? UTIs can get pretty severe. So when you have bacteria in the urine, um, it's usually isolated to you know just where the urine is in the body, so in, in the kidneys or in the bladder. But sometimes if there's so much bacteria in the urine, it can actually spread into the bloodstream. And then once it's in the bloodstream, that you know obviously goes um, throughout the entire body. And that's really the most common reason um, that people can get severely sick from a urine infection is because it's actually spread to the bloodstream and it's no longer just a UTI. Um, and that happens more frequently, again, in elderly individuals because they're, like I've said, their immune system just isn't as strong as it once was. Are younger people susceptible to that as well? So they are. It doesn't happen as often, um, but I, it definitely can happen in younger people. Um, most of the time, younger people will start having high fevers with a severe infection in the bloodstream like that. Um, they can also get the confusion and delirium, but they usually have um, you know, a, a stronger immune response with fevers that indicate that something is really wrong. Yeah, the question I had, when you ind indicated it could get in the bloodstream, could a severe UTI untreated trigger sepsis? Yes. So essentially, sepsis is a broad term that involves changes in your blood pressure and heart rate and markers of infection and your immune system overall that usually, that can be due to a lot of different things, but in the setting of infection, bacteria in the bloodstream definitely would cause sepsis. So they're, they're kind of the same thing, two different terms to describe the same scenario. Wow, that's really interesting. Okay, now, Steve and I are definitely getting older. That's what I was saying. We need to lean into this conversation. So is there anything that we can do to prevent this delirium? Well, I think from a urinary tract infection standpoint, if you develop urinary symptoms where you feel like you're maybe not emptying your bladder all the way um, or have a weak or slow stream, and this is, you know, common, this is uh, kind of tailored towards the man. This, this happens with enlarged prostates where you have a weak stream, um, difficulty emptying the bladder, maybe develop stones um, in the bladder. And in that case, you should see a urologist so that we can help treat those urinary symptoms so that your risk of developing a UTI and subsequent delirium is less. There's even a surgery for that, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. We have actually multiple different surgeries that can be done for enlarged prostates that are causing urinary issues. Um, and it kind of depends on the size of the prostate and your age and otherwise health status on, you know, what kind of procedure is right for you. A friend of mine had that done several years ago, said it gave him his life back. Yeah, it definitely can improve uh, urinary symptoms. For men, as you get older, um, you know, I tell men that sometimes, like, depending on what kind of procedure you get and where you started, you know, you may pee like a 25-year-old man again. 
<laughs> you may, you kind of answered this when you were talking about the sepsis. I was wondering if this bacteria can come from other areas beside urine, and you said yes. Yeah, so you could develop sepsis um, and bacteria in the blood uh, from any type of infection, essentially. So from a infection in your skin, you know, gallbladder, bowel, you, lung infection, you name it, any type of infection can, if it is severe enough, can develop bacteremia, which is bacteria in the blood, and then sepsis. You know, Dr. Ben, you've done a great job answering my questions. For our listeners out there, is there any final message that will help them and their families? I think that, um, you know, it's important to recognize the symptoms of a UTI, whether um, you are a younger individual or an older individual, um, and to understand that a acute change in your mental status and delirium is definitely something that needs to be evaluated and not ignored because it can be a symptom of some, you know, significant underlying problem. So I think that just making sure that um, patients who do de develop delirium are evaluated and looking out for these other symptoms of urine infections are important. And, um, you know, if you're having urine infections and problems with recurring infections, regardless of your age, then um, you should you know, be sure to follow up with your primary care doctor and potentially see a urologist. Dr. Casey Benz, a urologist at Methodist Dallas Medical Center. Thank you for this very valuable information. Steve? You know, Thomas, to all our listeners out there that have joined us on this very special day of Christmas, thanks for taking time out to be with us. But we hope also that you're enjoying your family, that you have a wonderful holiday. And as we look forward to 2023 and the new year, we hope you'll tune in for the human side of healthcare.